at Columbia College in Columbia, South Carolina, speaking with John Long, who's the horticulturist here. John, how did you start your association um, with Columbia College? Well, about 12 years or so ago, uh, they called uh, the company I was with uh, to do a, a major landscape design to rebeautify the campus, which they kept calling me back every six months. One thing led to another, uh, and they hired me full time, and I've been here, I'm um, working on my ninth year, be 10 years in February. Um, I know that as a designer, you always have a vision for what you want even a half acre garden to be, or a city block, which this is. What was your vision for Columbia College? Exactly, it's kind of overwhelming when you look at 33 acres, uh, so I, my, my vision was to create a series of gardens throughout the campus uh, that would uh, make an enjoyable walk, a more of an intimate setting than, than through a, you don't feel like you're in the a, in a middle of a, of a campus. Yes, because let's take that tour and we're going to start with the one as you pull in and park at the front of the campus. I believe that's the one that's in memory and honor of Georgia O'Keeffe who was here for a while. And how in the world do you take her abstract, strange kind of pictures and make, try to relate that into a garden? I had to do research, which is uh, rewarding in itself once I learned all her techniques. The most fundamental aspect was the use of line. And so I used a repetition of plant material to create that, that line effect uh, by using drift roses in one area, um, uh, lower petalum in another, and a series of perennials, uh, various uh, cone flowers with Tropicana uh, canna lilies, uh, which also brought out the southwestern yes. influence and, and the use of color that she used. There's a massive grass-like plant that anchors it. Right, that it punctuates the end of that aspect of, the, uh, of that garden, and that's Lamandra uh, catrinus, which is the, the giant version of, uh, of that grass. Uh, it gets about four feet tall and four feet wide. It's evergreen, evergreen. so it's a, a, a thrive on neglect, very drought tolerant uh, evergreen. I was interested in the Asiatic jasmine there um, that can really take over, and this is a cultivar that is slightly less aggressive. Yeah, it's still a vines, but it is uh, not as aggressive as the regular Asiatic. It's called snow in summer, mm -hmm. uh, which the new growth comes out uh, and turns to a, a white, a blush pink to a white as it matures, only on the new growth, because it will revert back to green. But when it is that new growth comes out, it's literally, as the name implies, for about two months, it's like a blanket of snow and this is in uh, late summer and it coincides with the blooms of the uh, mini noyuki double white flowering sasanquas uh, which will be blooming shortly right after that in October. Now we're going to go behind the library and that's um, a very compressed area. Tell me a little bit about the, the, the structure of it. Yes, it's a, it's a congestion is the right word because we have little niches where the benches are, and these uh, recessed areas were had Indian hawthorn at the time. That when you if you sat on those benches, you're you, you know you're got you're swallowed by the hawthorn. You, you couldn't even be seen. So I ripped all those out, fortified the soil, uh, planted some Japanese maple uh, called uh, bahu, uh, which is a yellow stem Japanese maple, a grouping of three yellow green leaf. Uh, Japanese maple and on the other side uh, to minimize maintenance I've used farfagium with uh, a foreplanting of uh, Lismachia Outback Sunset mm -hmm. which has yellow clusters of yellow flowers blooming right now uh, and a, a yellow yellow green variegated foliage which is evergreen so mm -hmm. that's ever I don't have to mess with that area anymore takes care of it itself. takes care of itself which is sustainability uh, is what I'm looking at. And then you explained to me that you use some tea olives there that are a little more shade tolerant. Yeah, the, uh, the holly leaf uh, tea olive is more shade tolerant than the fragrance uh, and will, will take, take a quite a bit of deep shade. 
because we're in, in between two buildings, uh, so it only gets about two hours of direct sun. And then a wax myrtle that just thrilled me to see. Yeah, it's uh, that through time this, this tree uh, fell over <laughs> and it's arching. It's got a very bonsai kind of feel to it. Uh, and it, with that, when it did that, it left room for some sun to peek in and we've got a uh, perennial uh, uh, morning glory and a, a common heliotrope blooming together. So I'll let nature take credit for that aspect of it. As we come to the end of that area, um, immediately in front of us is a large um, lawn area where the students can go out and throw frisbees and have fun and all that kind of stuff. And um, at the corner there is a very unusual red bud. Yes, it's, you don't see the, those very often around, uh, and it is uh, called uh, Texas White, and it almost has a weeping growth habit, uh, but it's got the glossiest I green mean, leaves that you've ever seen. I've never seen that before, and in that area, we really have a lot of hardscape, and we begin to have a slope, and so you didn't want to have just mountains of water washing down there, and you created, I thought, a very yeah, attractive uh, way to control that to Wash. take advantage of the fact that water is going to go there and, and to, again, minimize maintenance but make it aesthetically pleasing, uh, I've used large creek stone as a border uh, and as a dry creek bed to, to be able to take care of this runoff off the, off the, the sidewalk. Uh, and I have planted there uh, blue yucca, uh, uh, penicetum, uh, prince, which is a deep purple foliage comes back year after year after year and coral drift roses that's one area where the irrigation system is minimal so it's it'll take this hot dry area and right across from that uh, I have uh, a drift of uh, pink vinca uh, with uh, purple salvia amistad that has a deep, deep electric electric deep blue, purple. Yeah. deep purple, uh, and it gets it'll get some shade late afternoon from the overhanging live oaks that are in the background. So it works well. And again, that salvia people think that red red is for hummingbirds, but the hummingbirds adore that salvia. Exactly, it's like a hummingbird magnet. For it sure. really is, for yeah. Sure. And then the next area, we've got a good many raised beds. So let's talk about how they begin. One of them, which has some shade, I believe, has a plant that. I think it's going to be everybody's new favorite because it's, there's so many cultivars. Carex is really coming into its own. Yes, uh, there's so many varieties of it, uh, but the, the Carex, that one is called Everillo, uh, the chartreuse yellow green. Uh, Carex by, in, naturally likes it a little on the wet side anyway. It thrives when it's uh, in a moist area, but anytime you can bring in that chartreuse yellow to any shaded area, it brings out the, the other colors around it. And this Carex only gets about 18 inches tall, and you don't have to cut it back every year, but every three to five years probably you do. Uh, and behind it, I have uh, a red heuchera called uh, Sweet Tea. And behind that, I've got uh, Soft Caress Mahonia. So we have a layered effect there because we're transitioning to brutal sun to dappled shade to shade. And, and so within those raised beds, what are some of the plants that you have grouped together? Uh, as, we, as we first get started with the abelia, we, trend, we get into some, uh, there's a laura petalum called uh, purple pixie that it loves to be elevated. It does not, it has, has to have to really good drainage uh, for it to, to thrive. So, it, and it cascades over the brick wall and that serves another purpose because in the background we have the greens and you see how there's the varieties of Laura Petalum from this low cascading variety to uh, the Zhu Shao variety which is the, the, the gargantuan one that gets 20 feet by 20 feet. So I pruned those into to simulate Japanese maples because you don't really go that far you see it from a distance. So you see the contrast in, in, in growth habit, but with the same burgundy color. And we ought to take a moment to speak about the beautiful live oak that's there while we, before we go back to the yeah, flowers. Yeah, I don't know how I missed that because uh, there's, the, this pro, I think it's the oldest tree on campus and it's uh, 
close to 200 years old, at least 150 feet across. Uh, the reason I'm talking so intimate about it, I was pruning a limb five years ago and uh, fell off the ladder and broke my heel. So uh, always use an arborist. Yes. Don't do it yourself, even though you know what you're doing. Yeah. Use a certified arborist. Yeah. And then, but then back to the beds, we just have such a wonderful kaleidoscope of colors. Um, and yet you like to find a color and then find other plants where that may be as a secondary color and start playing off them. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, there is a, as we transition to the next garden, there's a long linear uh, raised garden, at, but to make it your eye flow through it, I've used three different plants that virtually have the same color or a, a, di a slightly different hue of, of the one color uh, from uh, the, the vinca to the hybrid uh, super petunia mm -hmm. uh, called uh, fuchsia to another super petunia which is fuchsia and white mixed. but they're re repetitive, but they're 15 feet apart, so it doesn't look so boring of all one thing. Uh, but your eye flows from one to the other. These super petunias do well. They, they stay compact. They don't get leggy. They spread, but they don't need a whole lot of water, which is another reason that the you know, drainage is really, really good there, being a raised bed. I also have a Provence a lavender, which at, at least in this area, has done better than any other variety. Plus it's raised, it drains well. Uh, hardly, I don't believe I've had to water it in six years. I'm using that to pick up the blue gray from a cat mint, mm -hmm. which is a little bit further down. And these blue spikes yes. are picked up with the, the salvia that's right adjacent to it, which we also have the Denver daisy uh, that picks up the little yellow in the Gomparina um, fireworks, yes. uh, globe amaranth that's in, intermixed all in through that. So it's kind of controlled chaos, but all these colors lead to a really pleasing transition. And then at the end, you've got a wonderful cascading prostrate rosemary. Yeah, rosemary, uh, I always, uh, it, it, it may be a signature aspect of what I do, but as we transition from one garden to another, I have something unique to punctuate the end of that. So I have a uh, creeping rosemary that's draping over the, the end of that wall. And to let you know who the designer was and where he went to school, I've got orange and uh, orange and red lantana with uh, purple angelonia. So I, there's orange uh, used quite a bit out here. For a Clipson graduate. But also we have a lot of purple and white Exactly. Which are the colors here for Columbia College? Exactly. Uh, we, we spoke about the uh, Texas white red bud. Underneath that is uh, the, the purple asters. So that I try to use purple and white too. And then if I purple, white, and orange, so I get the best of both worlds. And occasionally in a tree, we see a koala bear because I believe that perhaps is the mascot. Yep, yep. The, I actually have eucalyptus that the koalas like to eat. Oh. So there, there's, a, there's about eight or 10 of them around here. That's pretty thoughtful, it is. John, the administration building was a tremendous challenge because of the vast amount of concrete and reflected surfaces there. Um, and right now, it's truly lovely. You found a beautiful little blue flower, which is always fun. Yeah, that's uh, called Blue Days, D-A-Z-E, uh, it's Evolvis, uh, and in a one, and a one foot area there, it just thrives, uh, blooms now till, till January. And behind it, you had a very narrow raised bed. Um, how did you help reduce the scale and bring that down into proportion? That was kind of a no-brainer because there's only, few, there's only a few plants that can take that restricted soil space, and Italian cypress fit the bill. So much of the campus and the places we've talked about are very open. And, um, but then, right now, you and I are in a completely different aspect, um, a garden that I believe you designed to honor a former staff member. Yeah, this, uh, we're right in the middle of uh, Mitzi's garden. Uh, uh, Mitzi Winesett was a uh, student here, and uh, she worked here for many, many years. Her office overlooks uh, this, this beautiful uh, 
meditative garden. I, I designed this six years ago, seven years ago. Uh, there was the only thing that they, how they maintained this was with a bush hog. These, these large oaks and the uh, evergreen background of uh, holly osmanthus and uh, camellias were the, are the, were the only things that were here. Uh, it was a very steep area here, brought in about 100 tons of, of topsoil. To be very sensitive to these trees, we stayed uh, pretty much where this gravel walkway is. Uh, and I used this gravel walkway to serve as a protective area so these trees could really absorb the, the water and, and not be impeded by even six inches of soil. So the topsoil was placed all out in front of it exactly. to create an area where you could grow grass and other things. Exactly. And you used an interesting plant, location, location, and you, you are a master of micro environments, I think, and this taxis in many places in Colombia would not survive, but in this area, this taxis is doing beautifully. Uh, yes, I, I, I got a, I want to bet uh, somebody said this isn't going to make it, but I, I knew how the, the, the sun oriented itself, and this is uh, Taxius uh, uh, Duke's Garden. Uh, it's a double row. Uh, this, seven years now, I planted seven gallon plants. I have yet to touch this plant. Uh, and it only gets about two hours of direct sun, and it's all shade, which Texas must have. And then in here, to allow the students a quiet space, you have a very soft sounding fountain. Yep, uh, it's amazing all the birds. Uh, uh, water is a natural attractant for sure, but I've got a series of benches where it's a nice, nice meditative area uh, for that. Two fountains, which really makes this a nice, a place to decompress or, uh, or study. Uh, it's, it's the best kept secret on campus. I think some of the faculty and administrators know about it too yeah. and come in, but they don't want to have to <laughs> answer the telephone. Um, and then, John, you have tried over the years and found certain inoculants that you add to all the beds and um, it works for you and perhaps some of our viewers might enjoy wanting to try it in their home garden if you'll tell me what those two products are. Yeah, one is, uh, is called Great White, and it is a, it's a, a mixture of about 25 different fungi that you just mix with water when you plant. Uh, and then I follow up with a food for the fungi, uh, which is a kelp extract and molasses. And, uh, and I, I do that about on a monthly basis, All right. and it, uh, the results speak for themselves. And then, as we said earlier, when Columbia College was built, this was the farmland. And so, in reference to that, to the history, um, you have a small vegetable garden here. And I must say, your idea of improving soil certainly shows its prowess there because I think it's about a month old, and that is one heck of a good looking vegetable garden. Thank you, I'm very proud of it. And the tomatoes, I think, particularly so many people have trouble, but I think one of the things that you've been able to do here is because Columbia College is almost a micro environment in not being, and where, you, and where your vegetable garden is, great air circulation, and um, so fungal problems are less of an issue for you than they are for others. Yeah, that, that space uh, is, is almost in the center of the campus too, by the way, and it's very noticeable. Uh, but I'm protected from a lot of the winds. It does get good air circulation and I get good heat, uh, good sunlight on one side, and then I get late afternoon shade. So it's, I'm really fortunate that, that it is where it is. And you're now adding plants, herbs and pollinator plants to attract those important pollinators that we often forget about. Exactly, it is the most underused aspect of a garden is you gotta have pollinators or you're not going to have much success. John, as we begin to get out and visit more, and outdoor spaces are, of course, so important, um, if someone wants to see some of the work here, could they um, get in touch with you and perhaps have a tour? Sure, they could uh, email me at jlong at columbiasc.edu. Well, thank you for letting us share the beauty of the campus with our viewers. Thank you.